This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found Home Tech, show number 130, recorded on August 8th, 2013. Here at Home Tech, we cover all your favorite tech gadgets that find their way into your home. News, reviews, product updates, and conversation, all for the average tech guy. I'm your host, Jim Carlson, broadcasting live from the Average Guy Daphne Studios here in Bellevue, Nebraska. And we post the show with a world-class show notes. And man, if you haven't been reading the show notes, I've been putting a ton of work into those things. So pop over there, theaverageguy.tv. For this show, it would be theaverageguy.tv slash HT130. There's a little pattern there. You can probably figure that out if you want to go back to the, any of the previous shows. You can do that. And we put those out at theaverageguy.tv. If you have questions, comments, or contributions, you can contact me. Just send me an email, podcast at theaverageguy.tv. Find me on Twitter at Jay Collison or follow the show schedule at theaverageguy.tv. You can also join us for live chat during the show over at theaverageguy.tv live. Right below the live stream window, we actually now are streaming in low bandwidth mode as well with live stream. So if you go over to theaverageguy.tv slash live, back to Mike Fauché. Hopefully is doing that tonight on his way home on LTE. He is streaming the show, not involved in the chat while he's driving. Just want to let you know, not involved in the chat while he's driving. But he is watching us from his vehicle, and I always like to hear of those times when you're listening to the show, especially live if you're on a mobile device, because we continue to try and find ways to make the show work for you, both live and the recorded version. So we're doing that via live stream over at theaverageguy.tv. I also have a YouTube page if you go over there. If you want the high bandwidth version, just go to theaverageguy.tv. Upper right-hand corner, it'll say YouTube high bandwidth, and you'll get a really clear, crisp picture if you do it that way out there as well. So all those options available over at theaverageguy.tv. All right, well, we got a show. We're going to be uh, loading guys in as we progress on the show. I'm going to start with uh, my buddy in crime and a guy from the home server show, now freelancing everywhere, John Zadler. John, how are you? Hi Jim. Yeah, I took the time to be on your, you know, on your show to put in my schedule, and that's it. Now I'm here. It's always fun to uh, be chatting with you. Well, good to have you, John. You were on the last episode of BYOB 128, I believe it was, and I just actually got done listening to that. A great show. If you haven't listened to BYOB in a while, head over to the Home Service Show. BYOB that stands for Build Your Own Box, but these guys, some pretty smart hardware geeks out there. Oh, head over to the homeservershow.com and just search down a little bit. I think they have their own category and uh, you can check out BYOB. Last discussion, uh, John, you, Mike, and Michael chatting uh, quite a bit about Windows Server 2012 R2 Essentials as well as some other stuff and I think you actually birthed a uh, VM show that's going to be coming up shortly talking about the VM capabilities in 2012. Uh, looking forward to that. Yeah, I think they're gonna. That's what uh, they said. They're gonna look into that, and they're also gonna look into some of that storage spaces. Uh, it seems to be because they tweaked it a little bit in the in the R2 update. So, some things Good. to look forward to. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, we will. Uh, we're gonna be talking a little bit smidge about uh, essentials R2 here tonight. So, hang out for that. Uh, of course, we also did a first a Windows Server 2012 R2 essentials first look with Windows 8.1 uh, on show 124. So the average guy TV slash HT. One, two, four. John was on there with some others, and uh, we chatted. We, we took a first look. So if you want to go back and take a peek at that, uh, maybe stop this one, go back and listen to that one, and then come up to this one. And, uh, you know, we've had some four or five weeks uh, to kind of uh, digest Server 2012 uh, R2 Essential. So we'll talk a little bit more about that It's going forward. John also is going to do – so last week I put out a call to, uh, to folks uh, for this – tech scholarship fund that I was talking about. I said, hey, if you're interested in reviewing something, let me know. Send me an email, podcast at theaverageguy.tv. If it's in the budget and we can kick it out, you know, the Amazon, uh, when you guys kind of go out on the Amazon uh, link, theaverageguy.tv slash Amazon, we make a little commission. We're going to turn those commissions into these tech scholarships. John pinged me right away, and John, guess what came in today? It's here. So, John, I'll be shipping this off to John tomorrow. It's a 32 gig Kingston Data Traveler, and it's the 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 key is John right is that it's Windows to Go certified, right? Is that is that how it works? That's the big ticket because they have one that is exactly the same kind of packaging, and it's uh, I don't, I think maybe ten dollars less or ten or twenty dollars less, and you know it doesn't say that word, and you don't want to spend eighty bucks and then find out you got the wrong uh, USB key. Because yeah. that's what basically what they are is they're well the the two thing the two important things is that they're uh, USB three 
so they got that faster bandwidth, and they're more like a uh, an SSD on a USB flash, because even with SD cards and USB uh, sticks, you know, they're you tend to use them a certain amount of time, and and then they're they're you know they'll die eventually. But the uh, SSD technology, which is uh, you know like like we use in our PCs, you know, we can run write, write uh, you know thousands of times, and the speed is uh, is quicker. So that's what Microsoft is trying to do with uh, with, with Windows 8 is make it uh, mobile. Uh, so that uh, you know now instead of bringing your let's say instead of a company giving you a PC or let's say a laptop for you to bring home, it's like that whole BYOB stuff. You know, you know people trying to bring their uh, that laptops or desktops or not desktops to work, but their laptops to work and vice versa. It's like now we don't have to the companies don't have to supply you with a laptop. They'll they can just give you one of these keys. They'll say go to your home and it, you know you can even plug it in the MacBook Air. You know if you have a, a Mac PC at home, as long as it has USB three for the speed, it will work on a USB two. If you have a USB 3.0 device, you can plug it in there, boot up your Mac, hold the options key, and then it'll, it'll say, where do you want to boot? And you say, I want to boot from that Windows 8 to go. And it comes up, and you have a secure connection, VPN-type connection to your server at work, and you can, be in, you can end up managing all your files your, that the company allows you to, you know, these work folders and stuff. So it'll be interesting to see how, how all that works. Very cool. And Windows to go. So, John, I'll get this in the mail to you tomorrow. And then uh, also contacted by Kyle Wilcox, and actually I'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later, but Kyle's going to do a review for us as well. So if you got an idea, something you want to review, you know, something fairly inexpensive, we got, we're, you know, we're on a budget here, but if you use the averageguy.tv slash Amazon, we take that money, we turn it into tech uh, scholarships is what I'm calling us, or calling this, and then write a couple write-ups, drop them on the post, and you get to keep whatever I send you. So that's pretty cool. Well, speaking of keeping whatever I send them, just joining us over there to the left, Christian Johnson. Christian, how are you? What are you keeping, Jim? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I was just trying to make a segue. <laughs> How'd that go for you? <laughs> <laughs> not probably, obviously not very well. Now you could say keeping the intellectual interests of. That's right. Christian, how are you? I'm doing great, Jim. Good. Uh, hey, let's, let's warn folks. We're going to get a little housekeeping out of the way before we just dive into the show. Christian's got an announcement. Andrew's on his way in. So, Christian, are you okay taking uh, making your announcement right up front here? Yeah, that's fine. All right, let's let's uh, let's hear it. What do you got for us? Uh, I'm pleased to announce that after a roller coaster summer of job seeking and job opportunities, um, I'll be taking a position uh, starting on Monday with uh, Stinger Gafarian Technologies or SGT. Um, they are one of the major companies that supports the work that all 10 NASA centers do, USGA, and a handful of other government agencies. Um, and I'll be working um, in two areas, one with NASA's Atmospheric Science Data Center, working on their cloud infrastructure and um, analytics processing with Hadoop. Um, and I will also be working with the headquarters of SGT, um, aiding their business development and working with their center of excellence for big data on coming up with some strategic business um, advantages and strategies for their federal um, plans. So uh, really excited to be doing the technical work, uh, really excited to be doing a little bit of business development, um, and really some great opportunities as I segue into Maryland, uh, keeping the contacts down here at Langley working for the ASDC, um, and also having a uh, potential segue into future opportunities. So um, it's really a great transition out of the program that I've been in for almost a year and a half now, which was um, one of NASA's um, oldest and top-rated internship programs, which was the Langley Aerospace Research Student Scholars Program, and they have been on a 27-year run um, that will be over as of next year as they start to merge into NASA's new all-agency internship program. Um, so I will be one of the last Lars uh, intern students to leave NASA and will also be um, one of the first, uh, among one of the first uh, high schoolers that um, ever um, traverse the Lars program, so oh, very nice. um, felt really good to get a letter from the uh, U.S. Senator from Virginia, uh, kind of, you know, thanking me for my time there, so, uh, and it's it's really exciting to be moving on to still supporting NASA and its mission with some private sector work, and uh, 
moving on to a new name, new title, and a new opportunity. So it's, awesome. It's an exciting yeah. opportunity. Congrats. Good work. Uh, always good to – hey, John Zeller, what are you doing over there? I don't know. Something just <laughs> I just clicked on the box and something's going mental. <laughs> congratulations, Christian. <laughs> Leave the gadgets alone, John. Let's go. Yes, congratulations, Christian. Go, always good to to hear good news. We we knew there were some good things coming for you and kind of have held off talking about them. You've been a big part of the community and uh, and I think everybody wanted to hear what's going on with you. So school starts for you soon. You're on your way back home for a couple weeks and then uh, off to University of Maryland, which starts. September or or, or late, late late August. Um, I move in for classes August 28th. Um, however, I might do some business travel before I start school to get that out of the way. So I right. just have to play it by ear here. Very cool. Well, congrats. Good work. Uh, we're looking. We'll look forward to following you through school this year, and I'm sure it gets a lot a lot of updates on what you're doing there and and how that's going and the job and. All those things. Uh, major, uh, some major coverage this in the last week here. Also, you were in Computer World. I will put that link in the show notes as well. They interviewed you about the Vigo. Vigo contacted me and it went on a tweet and said, "Hey, thanks for some of the coverage and stuff." And I know you got an opportunity to. Were you also um, demoing the Vigo with them at Langley at one point? Was that? Did I read that in the tweet, or how did that all come together? Um. Well, I've done some internal demos for our our guys, but um, I believe Vigo actually contacted me directly and asked if Computer World, because um, they were interested in seeing how it was being used in businesses in the in the corporate sector. So um, I offered to um, tell them how I was uh, using it, and uh, yeah, it, it turned out well. Yeah, you were kind of the headline on that thing. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, long article, and I'll drop that in the show notes. Head over to theaverageguy.tv slash HT130 and look in there in the link to, or follow me on Twitter. I tweeted a whole bunch of it out, and uh, we talked about it. Um, and there was also a tweet for the um, financial podcast from, um, oh, give me a second. Audio Boo America. Um, yeah, yeah, we tweeted got, out that. So. They did. They actually, we were featured over at Audio Boo. So if you go to A U D I O B O O, we're also on Audio Boo. So that's another place you can go if that's a convenient place to listen to the podcast. Uh, they actually featured us this week and featured the Financial Tech Podcast. That's another one that I do. Andrew Hunt from the uh, Guide Rock Capital and the Gallup Federal Credit Union and a little 15-minute podcast if you. Don't listen to anything else financial. Might be a nice little um, podcast for you to listen to. TheAverageGuy.tv slash financial tech, I think, goes about to get you there. Just look for it out there and uh, some good stuff. So, yeah, a busy week on Twitter. And yeah, well, Twitter's uh, been hopping. Yeah, it's been pretty good. Which so is funny should... because I've, I've uh, had struggles keeping up with Twitter in the midst <laughs> of all this other madness. It is. Uh, it can be difficult at times. I like to use TweetDeck. That's kind of my I've I've kind of grown into TweetDeck as a Twitter you know client to manage on. And I just try and keep my phone connected into it so that I know if something breaks that it'll show up. Yeah, there you go. So, yeah, yeah good week at theaverageguy.tv. Lots of stuff going on, and uh, and so let me also cover just a few announcements. And let me say this: stay all the way to the end because I, I, we've got just a bunch of announcements going into fall. Lots of things going on, but let me get a few out of the way because they're important, and I want to get them out of the way early. If you don't want to listen to them, just skip ahead about five minutes, and, and we'll dig into the podcast here. But one, I do want to mention, you know, the Home Server Show Meetup, Home Server Show Average Guy Surface Geeks Meetup, September 21st, Indianapolis, Indiana, and and uh, we talked about this on the Home Server Show a ways back. But Drive Pop, that actually a company Dave has been working with, is sponsoring uh, is sponsoring me to go out there. So. Uh, we want to say thanks to DrivePop. They are a cloud backup or cloud uh, storage solution that's out there. Lots of information about that out at the site. If you go out to theaverageguy.tv and uh, and go down a post or two, there's some information about both the meetup and and uh, DrivePop as a sponsor. They've got some deals on. Uh, they got some actually they got some pretty good deals going on external uh, and cloud backups. So have a peek at that. Some stuff where you can buy a one time and get it get the storage for a long time, or you can pay. Um, as you go, but Drive Pop and DrivePop.com have a have a look at them. We want to thank them for sponsoring my journey, for my 10-hour journey from Omaha, Nebraska, all the way out to Indianapolis, Indiana. And uh, so we say thanks to Drive Pop for doing that for us. And there'll be a link in the show notes 
as well on uh, some information on them and as what's going on in the meetup as well. I do want to say if you are going to the meetup, head over to uh, homeservershow.com slash forums. I started a thread around travel from the airport to Fishers, which is where the conference is at. And so if you're flying in or you're driving in and you're driving by the airport, I've got a document out there that will help us kind of coordinate everybody's trip from the airport to Fishers. So uh, head out there. Um, I'll put the link in the show notes as well to that document, so you might want to take a peek at that. But I really need your help getting all that consolidated so we can get everybody from the airport to Fishers and then everybody back. Meetups come along well. We have 60 so registered. We're two thirds of the way to to being full, and we got a you know a trip to Fry's, a trip to the Microsoft Store. We're going to do breakfast on Sunday morning at Waffle House, uh, courtesy not really paid for, but courtesy of Mike Howard and uh, Waffle House. We're getting together for breakfast, so you want to head out. Who's getting excited about it? September 21st. All that information's out at the Home Server Show. Um, dot com. Also, a big thanks and a big shout out to Phil Churchill. Uh, if you've been a home server show listener for a while, he's at MSWHS.com. You know, he faithfully retweets and posts the Home Tech Podcast out on his show each week. And I hadn't I've been out there in a while, and uh, and I just noticed he did that. So I want to say, Phil, thanks for all the the uh, the publicity that you do for us on Home Tech, and I appreciate that as well. Also, a shout out to Chris uh, Ch- uh, Charmley. I think C H R. I'm sorry, C. I, I put an R in there. I shouldn't have. Uh, C-H-A-M-L-E-E, Shamley is probably how it's pronounced, uh, from the Friendly Computer Center LLC in West Texas. I asked in the show notes, I didn't really say anything, but I asked in last week's show notes, does anybody read these things? Send me a podcast or send me an email, podcast at theaverageguy.tv, and guess what? Chris was nice enough to send me a note and said he actually reads the show notes. We put a lot of work into those show notes, and so I was wondering, does anybody actually read these things? And Chris... Thanks for reading them. I appreciate that. If you read them, if you got any comments, send me an email, podcast at theaverageguy.tv. All right. Lots of announcements toward the end, like I said, so hang tight. we got lots of things going on, including a giveaway. I know I said we weren't going to be giving away things, but this we're going to give away. So hang tight till we get to the end of the show, and let's dig right in. All right. We got John Zadler here. That means uh, we're going to talk a little home server stuff up front, and uh, John's got some stuff. This is, you know, we didn't do a home server show last week, and if you're listening to this six months from now, you don't really care. We didn't have a show last week, but we're going to talk some home server stuff. John, what uh, what do you got for us? Uh, one of the nice things I like, uh, and I've been following, is uh, the developer. His name is Mike Craven. He's uh, he has the website uh, the Office Maven, and he's got some uh, add-ins that he's been working around since uh, Windows Home Server version one. And uh, what's nice is now that the uh, the R2 uh, Essentials build is out and everybody's kind of playing around with it and stuff, he's updated his add-ins to, uh, to run in the R2 uh, environment, which is pretty good because the R2, as opposed to the regular uh, Windows Server 2012 Essentials, if you looked, if you looked at the... Uh, uh, the web interface, like now Microsoft, they, they tried to make it more uh, user friendly or tablet friendly, right? Mobile friendly, where everything is these giant icons now. So uh, that kind of played around with the code. And one of uh, the options in in um, uh, Mike Craven's add-ins is you have web access. So he had to rewrite some of that code to to take uh, advantage of that. So uh, he was uh, he sends me. Um, I'm on his, one of his lists of uh, you know testers, so he sends me the add-ins to give him a test. So I've been playing around with that one, and uh, one of the good ones that they have is uh, that I'll just talk about for a couple of minutes. There is uh, is a remote uh, remote web app. So basically, you install this application. Uh, it's it's an add-in, so it finishes with the extension WSSX. So on your PC, you would download it, you would double-click on it, it would upload it to the server, and install it on the server. And then the other thing is it would add a uh, something into the uh, the launch pad, uh, you know, to that uh, reference to that app. And now what happens is uh, what you do is it ends up uh, you, you like you install application any application you want on the server. So you can say I'm going to install uh, I don't know uh, a photo album uh, app or something. What did I install? I installed something to do um, uh, Media Center Master. So I have that program running. You know, because uh, the server is always running, so I want to have that program running there in the background, Media Center Master. So what I can do is I can I, I can have since that ser- that application installed on the server, what I'll do is with this remote app, 
uh, I go and I publish it. What you do, it, it's with, it's called publishing. You basically you say this is the app I want to launch. I want to launch this uh, Media Center Master, and now it puts it uh, in the list of menus. And then what happens is when you open up the launch pad and you go to his app, you'll see a list of it in the launch pad of all the apps that you end up publishing, and you'll click on it. And then what it does is it'll actually bring the user interface of that application, which is running on the server, right? It's on a completely different machine. It's bringing that uh, UI, that interface, onto your desktop. So now on your desktop, you can go and, and uh, manipulate and run your program and stuff. So uh, like I said, it's, since it's a, uh, it's a, you can put any program you want, more or less, I think, any program. So whatever business program you have that's kind of running, that you want to run on the server, you know, you'll have uh, access to it on the uh, on your PC, so that's pretty good. And uh, and these are like business apps, right? So they're not like you know ten dollar apps. It, it's a little bit pricey. Uh, you know, it's it's made for businesses. So I think they're anywhere between fifty dollars and and a hundred and fifty dollars the app, depending on uh, which one you buy. Because there's a plus version and a regular. Uh, well, for this for this app, there's just one version. But like for his office apps, there's a, pl a regular version and a plus version, which adds. Uh, you know, uh, hooks into stuff like uh, uh, Microsoft Project and Visio and that stuff. But uh, for this app, it's. Uh, did you see the price there, Dave? Uh, Jim, do you, is no. it? Uh, How, you call me Dave. That's funny. Dave, uh, geez, what's going on there? <laughs> I, my I have to bite my tongue on that one. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, hold on, let me look up here. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't see it, but I remember him being. Oh, here's pricing. Let's take a peek. And um, yeah, if you go to the products, like you scroll down, you'll see it's yeah, I don't think he has pricing out for the for these apps yet because they're still okay. are they still in beta? Uh, well, this version, is, yeah, this R2 version is just like just released. So uh, you know, within the past week, he's he's updated them. Uh, let me see. Yeah, see. So if you go in the pa in the pull down menu, you see WSE Remote App Twenty. It's a long name. It's like my, my you know how Microsoft gives these giant names there for their apps. So the same thing is WSE Remote App Twenty Twelve R Two. So it means Windows Server Essentials. And then there's a version for Windows Home Server. And then there's a version for uh, yeah Windows Home Server and Server. And then just regular uh, Windows Server. You know the non R Two version. So let he, me see. Do, he does have a trial version, 21-day trial version as well. If you want to give that, if you want to give that a shot. John, I know you've used these a lot. You've been, we've been talking about this product for a while, on on home server. Uh, anything that you use on this remote side? You know, the, they have Office and QuickBooks and and Quicken. I think those are the other three that he does. On this remote app, any app that you use uh, frequently, or the, your favorite app that you would use with this? Well, out of his his add-ins, my favorite one is the Office one, which gives right. you the, the whole shebang. So it's the Office Plus, and that one, like I said, I, I can play around with Visio and uh, Microsoft Project, and uh, yeah, you know, and then Outlook and all that. And what I like about that is because, like I've said in the past, on my server, I like to just on my PC, I have a SD card, uh, SD drive, and uh, SSD, SD drive, SSD drive, and I like to keep it. You know, minimal stuff, and then so if I have to have, if I ever have to rebuild my PC, you know, I have the minimal stuff. So this is nice because the add-in and all the software, Office and everything, is basically installed on the server. So when you get this guy going, you just install the connector, and now you have access to all your apps. And it's you can't even tell the difference that. Well, there's a bit of a graphics. I think the resolution is a little lower than if you ran, let's say, Outlook. If you ran, let's say, uh, Outlook 20, uh, what is it, 2013. If you ran, ran it on the desktop, or you ran this remote uh, version of Outlook, but it's just as fast. So the, I think, yeah, the resolution is a little bit off. But I think that has something to do with with the server. You know, it's because yeah. it's a server, and you're not really running a good graphics card, and it's a remote desktop connection. You might be able to up the uh, the uh, resolution. But uh, I mean, I, I run it and. And like I said, that's my favorite one. And the one I'm getting used to now playing around is this remote app because you can put any app you want. So if you have some some kind of app, you know, other than this Office or Quicken or like we said before, uh, uh, QuickBooks, you know, if you have some app that you say, look, it's running on the server, but I just want to see it here on my desktop, then it's uh, it's, it's pretty nice. Because that's one nice thing that I like that Microsoft kind of did with the Windows Server, this version. When you had the old version, and if you had, uh, let's say, Windows Home Server version 1, which is based on Server 2003, when you tried to do a remote desktop app, 
like you opened up a big window on your screen and you knew that you were kind of like looking at a screen inside a screen on your PC but here it's like Microsoft really cleaned it up just like when you open up the dashboard and you say you click on the Windows update for the server and the window pops up and it's you know it gives you like the Windows updates for the server you know you can mistakenly think that this is my Windows update for my PC because it just opens like an like an app you have it doesn't open in a window in the window so it's pretty nice. Uh, yeah, I see. Uh, 100 I USD, this. John. Yeah, 100 yep. USD for uh, the R2, and then see as the R2 Plus, which is yep. uh, 175. 25 users. Yeah, the first one is 10 users, 25 remote apps. The other is 25 users, unlimited remote apps. The Office one that you're talking about, 75 USD for up to 10 users, and uh, 25 users in the Plus version at 125. And if these are great add-ins because they're not like just simple add-ins. Like I said before at the beginning, it's like these are you know off. This is office stuff. You know, it's and there's a lot of work put into the add-ins. Like I said, you you use it on the desktop. Uh, it creates links to uh, uh, like there, there's a lot of smarts in there. And then the, the remote stuff, which like I said before, was from the web apps. You know, if you're let's say at another location, you're you know you're at work or you're at your friend's house and you want to open up your Outlook. On your server, you know, you, you can do it that way. Obviously, you have other ways to, you know, on your iPad, you can connect to your whatever um, Office 365 account if you have that or whatever. But it, it's it's I, I I've been using it and I like it. Yeah. Uh, so again, Phil Churchill over at MSWHS got a good write up on that, and uh, you can all the links. That's what we just used all the links there to uh, to get access to that. All right. What else, John? Uh, I saw something here, TechHead, uh, an article on HP ProLine G8, where they take a look at the CPU, disk controllers, and the memory, networking capabilities, as well as all the other hardware. So we can put a link in the show notes on that one. Uh, it's nice to see that 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 server, the Gen 8, is now starting to become you know popular, and uh, and these articles are coming out, and people are are doing some stuff. So I like that one. And uh, the other article was something about a. Um, uh, Windows IT Pro, they have an article on the Gen 8, um, it's like a switch. So it's, it's a box that's made in the same form factor of the uh, of the Gen 8 server, so it sits right on top, or you could put it under the server. So they got a breakdown of uh, how they, you know, what the, you know what's good about that router, because it's a little bit pricey. I think it's between $100 and $200 for that, uh, that router. So, uh, uh, hey, John, real quick, so yeah. Other Jim, or as Rennie called him, O Jim, uh, ask, so server has two concurrent uh, term service accounts. Does does this get past that? Yeah, like uh, you can have multiple users. You know, yeah, if you, you have can, ten users, you can have ten users running, if, depending which license you want. You can have ten users at so the yeah, same time. Can, ten, yeah, ten, so ten people can run Visio all at the same time, right? Yeah, but you know, again, now you're kind of you know, Visio is a, is a heavy program, uh, but you have you know, you have to have the, the horsepower over on the server. Don't put on, on on the microserver, uh, you know, Visio, and then have ten people trying to run uh, right. run that. Just like you know, let's say if you if you run the Office app, uh, the Office one, and you're running Excel, and you have this big giant spreadsheet, and you know, and the five people are kind of working on the same spreadsheet over on the server, you know, that's it's going to be sweating it out. The program can do it, but it's like, will the server, you know, uh, you know, drop yeah. out? Yeah. Well, good questions, Jim. He, he's he got it. Uh, John, back to the Gen 8. So last week after the show, of course, you were on the show last week. Christian, you were there, but I think you were sleeping most of the show. <laughs> <laughs> and yes. uh, of, of, of 128. So if you go back and listen to 128, we talked about hard drives. Uh, we said goodnight to Christian. He went to bed. Kevin Schoonover joined us, and, and we did a podcast kind of out of order. So 129 is really just the after show. I always say I never do those, but... I never put those after shows out as recordings, but it was so good. Kevin, John Stutzman, John Zadler, and and myself and Andrew Morris, we did uh, show 129 just on the Gen 8. So if you want to want to get a first look at that and you kind of miss that out of order, head back to 129, have a look at that. We covered that in pretty good detail with some pictures. We talked about some various equipment. We we talked through drive configurations. Kevin Schoonover gave me a bunch of pictures to post, and they're all over on that post, uh, theaverageguy.tv slash HT129. And you might want to take a peek through that, some good pictures and uh, some good updates on that. The Gen 8, John, is that, uh, you know, you we, we sent you a couple of the, uh, the microservers before. Uh, let me ask you, and I'll ask Christian too, what do, you, what do you think of this new Gen 8? Christian, have you even had time? Let me ask you, Christian, first. Have you even had time to look at the Gen 8? Nope. Okay. All right, so you got a little catch up to do 
on that. Pretty nice little box. It seems stackable, uh, John. <laughs> We, we mentioned last week you can stack up to three, and I always thought, why, why just three? Are they gonna, is the bottom one going to get crushed? But um, your thoughts on the Gen 8 now that we've seen it for a week? Well, I, I like that uh, Microsoft, uh, not Microsoft, but HP came up with that box. And, uh, oh, look at that. The video's starting. Your video is actually starting on another window. I got up. Can I pause that? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, uh, sorry. yeah the Gen 8's like their, uh, I mean, I always loved when the HP came out with their Media Smart servers. But they were kind of like restricted that they didn't have a video out. What's nice about these boxes, you know, even the the, the pre Gen 8, which is like we have the N36, the 40, and then the new 54. That was just and you can get super deals. They're great little machines for using the house or the small office and stuff. So if you don't have you know 400 plus dollars to buy the Gen 8, you know, get one of those guys. The, and the, you know, they still have the hundred dollar specials here and there. So they're great little boxes. They do have the VGA like the Gen 8. But what's nice is. Uh, HP, uh, I guess they listened to people, or you know, they made three iterations of that server, and they said, okay, you know, how can we kind of like uh, fix it up, do something better uh, with the same, more or less uh, size uh, form factor. And uh, some of the things they did was they made the uh, the CPU. It's just now a socket, whereas the other one is like, you know, if you bought the 40, and then six months, nine months later, you know, 54 came out. It's like ah, oh, you know, it's faster bu speed there, but I can't swap out the CPU. So at least with the new Gen 8, you can swap out the CPU. The memories they have, the memory slots um, are on the side of the box, so it's very easy to take off the cover, and then you can just get to the memory. Whereas with the the previous versions, you gotta you know take open the door, take the cover off. You have to take the cover off? No, you don't have to take the cover off. Open the door, take these screws out, pull up pull off these cables, pull the board out, and then you get to the memory. Okay, you're not doing the memory, you know, every day, but uh, with the new box, they've made that a lot more convenient. And then, like, the locking mechanism, now it's actually a little plastic uh, lock that's on the inside. You actually have to take the cover off, and then you can lock the door, put the cover back on, screw the bolts, and now, you know, people can't open the door. And uh, so that's a couple of nice little tweaks they have. And then they have some uh, ILO connector, they have a couple of, they put two gigabit uh, network connections on it. Uh, like I said, the, the CPU is a little bit beefier and stuff. So uh, so they've done a lot to, to that little machine. And, you know, I, I, I hope to see, uh, you know, these new versions, like when Microsoft releases the uh, R2 finally, uh, I don't know when it will be, maybe next month or so, the uh, Server 22 Essentials R2. I'd like to see uh, uh, either HP or maybe Newegg do some kind of bundle where uh, they, they, they give you that machine and the server for like a thousand bucks and it would be great, you know, your little doctor's office or little lawyer's office or whatever, you just bring in that box, put it there, turn it on, you know, and, and away you go. Yeah, it's, it's a nice good, little box. It's a good looking box and uh, Kevin had posted this week, I think he's already replaced the CPU. What's what's the CPU that you can you can switch that with, John? I don't know, I think they have something, a 1610 and a 2020, which I don't know what that means, <laughs> but <laughs> those are different models that are in there. That's I would buy stock. the one with the yeah the stock ones. Yeah, I would buy the one with the like the lowest because there's it's two price range, right? The lower the better one. You know, buy the one if you want to switch it up. If you don't want to switch it up, buy the better one and save yourself some headaches. If if you're a tech guy or enthusiast there and you want to kind of get to it, well then yeah, buy the buy the cheaper one. And what's nice is HP is kind of making these boxes uh, um, you know no OS, so you're saving some money there. Right, because if you bought a server at some at Dell or whatever, like they sell you the you know the box with the OS, and you know again you're paying maybe five hundred dollars for the OS. What's nice is that these box they they have no server, uh, no uh, OS. And um, the other gen, the previous gen that I was talking about, the thirty six, the forty, the fifty four. I think those come with a two hundred fifty gig hard drive. This, these models come with no hard drive at all, which you know it's okay because the other ones they gave you, uh, I think, a 250 gig hard drive. You know, what are you going to do with that? You know, 250. I used it to balance my table. You know, just so that it doesn't rock. <laughs> sure. You know, 250 gig. Forget it. <laughs> Two terabytes or more. And the other thing is these. I think these drives are. Um, the BIOS has been updated. So. The previous one, the N36, the 40, and the 54, the maximum you could put as the OS drive, or you can use an SSD drive, but they only support the, uh, I think, the two terabyte drives. Whereas this one, you can put, because of the BIOS, Christian, maybe, uh, maybe Christian will hack the BIOS for us and stuff. Uh, you can have like three, uh, four drives, four three terabyte drives, and uh, I think I read that that's supported. So maybe some guys in the chat will have to back me up on that one. But that's what I that's what I had read, 
is that you can put the three terabyte drives and you know boot off the three terabyte drive. Christian, so how, how soon, next, how soon uh, can we get a BIOS advantage. mod for this? I don't know. <laughs> it depends on uh, you how get soon your, the image becomes available. Get your uh, crack mechanics over there at BIOS mods to uh, to tear this thing up for us and see what they're hiding. I mean, they 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 hid quite a bit. One of the I think it might be the number one post over there, John. You'd correct me if I'm wrong. Over at homeservershow.com in the forums is the the it, I think it's called like hidden uh, I forget what it's hidden something on the BIOS of the N40L, and it started a way I, you might have even started it, John. We got Christian to get the BIOS mod for us. I think that thing has done a gazillion hits out there, at least a gazillion views. So you're kind of a rock star there, Christian. I'm just saying. All right, all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's definitely a good uh, article because, like I've said, I even these guys who played around with Synology and stuff like that, they're trying to put you know uh, Synology or different even different OSs on these boxes. Like they're they're using they they want to use the uh, Christian's uh, update because one of the things is that that's in there is the uh, you can speed up the. Uh, the uh, SATA port that's on the because standard my, what you know uh, what HP did is you know basically they wanted you to connect your uh, CD drive or your uh, Blu-ray drive, so they they put the speed at 1.5 megabits, but with Christian's uh, BIOS mod you can up you can send that set that up to three uh, three gigabits per second yeah you know so double so and now you know put an SSD because why would you put an SSD drive but be limited to you know 1.5 megabits speed. It, it didn't make kind of make sense, but at least now you can use the three three point oh speeds and uh, and go down. So a lot of these guys are like they're they're throwing that on there, whether they're running Windows or not. They want to have that upgraded BIOS. Hundred and seventy five thousand views on that uh, one post alone, called modified BIOS for microserver N forty L enables hidden features. John, you started that, and um, yeah. There you go. <laughs> you started the you started that craziness, and Christian made it happen, and uh, that has probably been the number one uh, between the two of you. That has been there's been a lot of uh, traffic around that, so some good stuff. Christian, we'll have to uh, keep you posted on, or or you'll have to keep us posted to see if we can get that to Gen Eight looked at to see if they're any they're hiding anything from us. Sure. Right, sounds good. John, what else? Oh, you'd had a you'd have put an article in there as well. Uh... Let me take a peek here. Yeah, the only drawback with the Gen 8 right now is the uh, is we had an issue with the uh, trying to get the um, uh, R no that's not the Gen 8 the older version sorry the older versions of the server trying to get R2 essentials on there that was the problem with the BIOS and the uh, um, the NIC card so I don't know if Christian might have some kind of dance for that but uh, I'm wondering if the uh, if uh, Kevin Schoonover is having a, an issue I think he he. He reported on Twitter today he had a problem. He installed a RAID card, and I think he was having a little bit of issue. But uh, we'll have to go back to him and see, get an update. You know, like I said the last time, live vicariously through uh, uh, Kevin to see, uh, you know, how he's getting uh, R2 on there. Yeah, certainly a lot of traffic going on in the community around the Gen 8, and a lot of discussions about it. A lot of guys bought the 40s and the 54s, and uh, and so there's still tons of support out there for that. Those. <laughs> those won't stop working. Be great for you, and you can use them that way as well. So uh, you know, don't fret if you've if you just picked up a 54 and a good deal. The Gen 8, I threw up the post 414 at Newegg right now. That's not bad uh, for that little box. So some a pretty good deal going on at the Newegg. I don't have a Newegg affiliate link, but Dave does. So if you think you're going to go out and buy one, head over to the HomeServerShow.com, run through his Newegg affiliate link, and uh, pick it up for 414. I don't think we'll see it much cheaper for a while. You might see some 399 deals come out uh, shortly, but uh, something uh, certainly to take a peek at. All right, any any more Gen 8 talk, John? Or you want to move? Are on they available on Amazon? Uh, yeah. yeah they are were, they available they on more, Amazon? Yeah, they were more expensive. More expensive? Uh, let me let me take okay. a quick peek here. Yeah. Uh, HP Gen 8. Let's look. Uh, micro. I looked them up. They, yeah, they were um, good enough deal that you would want to right at least right now. Uh, they are 448 on Amazon. So right now, good enough deal. You want to head over to Newegg and pick them up if you're going to go that way. John, talk about StableBit. Cool. They got some stuff. Some yeah, the other one I had. Yeah, StableBit. Uh, let me see. Uh, it's version 2.5.0. This is StableBit Scanner. Yeah. 
because I don't want to get mixed up with the uh, with the uh, drive pool. But stable bit scanner, he, there was an update for the uh, the Colorado projects project. Uh, pro that sounds like a movie, eh? the Colorado projects. Um, Colorado products, the Windows Home Server 2011, Small Business Server 2011 Essentials, Windows Storage Server 2008 R2 Essentials, and Windows Server 2012 Essentials has been updated. Version 2.5.0.2940. So if you want to watch your... I, I actually um, I bought a license. Actually, I'm going to buy a license. My brother uh, set up an R2.8 uh, storage server at some company and then they wanted to put the drive pool on there, and so I took advantage of the uh, their special where it's like usually the add-in is twenty bucks, but if you put in your code from the if you've purchased it before, you know you you'll put in your code from your previous purchase into the um, where it says where you buy where you pay now, and then they'll say oh okay you know that's a val validate that code, and then now the price will change from twenty nineteen ninety nine to ten bucks. So I said I told my brother I says your company's gonna pay twenty bucks for it. Well, what you're going to do is you're going to get a, you know, the drive pool license, and you're going to pick me up a stable bit, uh, this one, the scanner license for ten bucks. I'm going to get so I want that scanner license, so I'm going to put that on my box. And sure enough, the other day um, I installed that yesterday, and uh, what did it tell me? It gave me a heat warning, because that's the other thing is besides just being, uh, you know, scanning your drives for error and stuff, like that, it could tell you if your drives are, you know, within, to within tolerance for the heat. And some drives do run a little bit differently. You know, the, you know, if you have red drives and black drives and blue drives, they run at different temperatures. So uh, what's neat is uh, he ha he does have some kind of like uh, the, the U in the UI, I'll say, uh, you know, I've got this temperature, it's a little high. What do you want to do about it? And then there's uh, at the bottom there's something like uh, it's an update there, basically like you're updating their database or you you go to their database to get more specific uh, information about your drive. So that, then it'll kind of bring that in there, and then they might recalculate and say, "Oh, okay, yeah, that's that's within tolerance or whatever." And then you can tell it to ignore the um, ignore the warning. But basically, what you're doing is because you know you always have that warning popping up every time you boot up your server. You can say, "Look, ignore the warning unless it gets worse." That's that, which is good because you don't want to ignore the warning and then your drive keeps creeping up the temperature and then it, it does fail. So at least you can say ignore it for now, but it, but basically if it gets worse, then you know come back and let me know. And then at that point, uh, and what's great about it is because it, if you it it it, it um, works in conjunction with their drive pool add-in. So if it sees that the drive is overheating and stuff like that, it, it'll start offloading some of that uh, some of your data onto the other drive. So it might be nice. I'm not sure exactly if it, if it works this way, but I'm kind of guessing. And I hope if Alex is listening, the good developer, then maybe he can correct me and you know send you an email. Um, let's say a, you know drive is starting to fail. Imagine it just starts like, okay, I'm gonna offload all that stuff on that other drive uh, on the rest of your pool. And then in the morning, you know, when you come to work and you click on the the icon, it says, hey, you know, this drive is failing, and we took all the junk off it, and you know now just swap out the drive and put in a new one. So that would that would be a nice uh, end goal for that. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things is I brought up this slide. Uh, it says StableBit scanners uh, is able to recover damaged files by reading around the damaged parts first, then it employs multiple recovery profiles in order to attempt to recover the bad sectors. Pretty cool. You know, he keeps Alex just keeps developing this stuff, and uh, really like the look of it, and uh, does a nice job in the development cycle. So good work. Yep, right. and the other thing, uh, somewhat in reference to uh, Alex there and, and Drypool, Drashna, uh, Chris, uh, uh, Christopher Courtney is, is does the support over at uh, at those guys and helping them out. And this guy is like a, a guru, uh, Windows Home Server guru. He knows everything. So he's he's my he's got my he's my wingman there. You know, he's making sure that Alex is staying on Windows Home Server because <laughs> they're also doing that Windows 8 Drive Pool and this and that. But you know, don't forget my Windows Home Server. You got to be my guy. You got to take care of me. Take the hits. So uh, Drashna actually pointed me to uh, um, a developer uh, who's making an ad. It's called Windows Home Server 2011 Media Collector. Uh, so there's a post over. I'll give you a show notes a link. And uh, there's a post over at We Got Served, and these guys are talking about it. So one developer says, you know what? I'm going to write a, an ad in. Uh, and the reason, what's nice about this ad in, just to give you a little bit of background, is uh, I've seen a lot of posts in the in the home server forums. Is guys had the media smart servers, and one of the things that HP had is they gave some of their software. They had a media collector, and then they had a photo uh, a photo software, and uh, a videos uh, converter, 
uh, software. And the media collector, basically, basically what it did is you had a little app that was running as a ta task scheduler on your PCs, and it would go and find all your photos, all your videos, and all your music, and it would kind of, and then it would uh, copy it. Yeah, copy it. It wouldn't move it. It would copy it to your server. So now that's good because as soon as you add a computer to your network, it would have the those uh, folders are basic. Those files are basically backed up on on the server, and uh, every once in a while it just scan, you know scans your computer and it says oh, I found a couple more music and I'll you know I'll toss it in the folder. So basically on the server you have a music's folder, videos folder, and the pictures folder. And then what this app does is there's a little uh, configuration file that you run, and uh, so what it'll do is let's say your PC is called your user on your PC is called John. So now on the server is going to have the server name slash pictures and then it'll create a folder called John and then in John it'll put all my music and then so forth with the videos you'll have videos slash John and then the, all your videos in there and everything gets popular so you know you're not mismatching everybody's videos all in the same place yes there let's say all the videos are in the sh videos shared folder but you'll have like a John Dave Jim uh, Christian whatever all these different folders and they'll have their stuff so you know, that's one of the things that people uh, you know wanted when they you know jump to uh, Windows Home Server 2011 so it's nice to see that this guy's working on that and it's a little app that you actually you, you, this app you install the collector on the PC there's no uh, there's no, no there's no app that's actually that's running on the server it's just copying it to the server you point to the server you say this, these are my shares this is where the stuff is you know Hopefully people go over there and I tweeted it and you know they'll say, hey guy, you know make it make it into a nice add-in and you know, continue to develop it. Maybe put an interface for uh, on the server and you know let's go and you know continue to develop it. And uh, I I hope he continues to develop. Yeah, good. That's we'll, one of the things I, I do use. We'll put that link in the show notes over there at the it's in the forums that we've got served. You might need to create a forums account to get that rolling, but uh, I will put a link in the show notes to that as well if you want to take a peek at it. Yeah, it's pretty interesting, you know, uh, John. On on the last BYOB, you and are you and Mike and Michael were talking about uh, media collection, you know, through the native kind of media uh, um, options that comes with Essentials uh, that's out there, and and nobody has a lot of good things to say about it. I know for the longest time we've been talking about Subsonic, of course. Christian has a huge influence in that. I know his dad's out there listening. I saw him in chat. And uh, Subsonic keeps seems to keep rolling around as well. Christian, uh, through the summer, have you stayed? Uh, have you guys done anything with Subsonic? Is, I assume there's been some upgrade stuff. Have you stayed in touch with that, or you pretty much let your dad handle it? He's pretty much been on it this summer. I've had my head in way too many other things to be thinking yeah. about it. But yeah. um, they, I know they have um, the one of the branches of Subsonic called Mad Sonic. I know it has a lot of neat features and add-ons. That's kind of like the I don't know. I guess the the guru version of Subsonic. It's a little bit more built out and has all the the nerdy features in it. So yeah. Well, I know Gary's big into that, and uh, we from time to time we've talked about Subsonic, and uh, he's even Gary's even set up guest accounts for folks that uh, that might want to uh, give it a try. So if you're into the media end of it, we'll have those that we'll have that link in the show notes as well. If you've got any questions on Subsonic, of course. Brought those through me. I'll get those uh, to Christian to Gary, and, uh, and Gary's very helpful in that area. He might be one of the, I, you know, one of the guys that uh, knows more about it than maybe some of the developers. So, uh, good stuff. If you're if you're trying to collect your media, and, and I I gave up. I'll be honest. I just moved all my music to Amazon, and put it in their in their cloud, you know, music player, and that's just kind of where I get it from. I don't even have I don't have a lick, one MP3. Anywhere on my network, it's all gone. It's all it's all at uh, Amazon, and uh, that's where I keep it. So, interesting. All right, John. What else? Anything else? Yep, there is a public preview, public beta preview. That's Microsoft again with these names. Uh, Microsoft has a uh, update rollup three for Windows Server 2012 Essentials. So this is not for the R2. This is for the 2012. So you know, maybe some people might be jumping to the the uh, R2, and you know, go ahead that way. But if you if you got the 2012, because you can't right now 2012, you can't just uh, upgrade to the R2. You can't just run the R2 and upgrade that server. So it's like, oh, we have this server 2012 essentials. Uh, you know what? You know what can we do? It's like, okay, you can you can still do these upgrade. You know, they found a couple little. Um, 
errors or you know fixes that or things that people ran into and uh, Paul uh, Paul Brerin one of his things about uh, the DNS connecting the PC sometimes they don't find the server there's a bit of a mess going on there so I think they're uh, they're working on that one and uh, the only th the what's important it's on connect Microsoft Connect site so you have to kind of like register or log in there uh, with your uh, Microsoft ID and then you can download it and install it and the thing is, just like the Windows 8 preview, you know how like if you install this add-in, then later when the, when the when the real one finishes in its release, you have to remember to uninstall this this preview, or it'll never upgrade to the to the the final release. So this is something you know, put something if you're gonna do this, put something in your whatever calendar and say, hey, uh, you know, uh, I seen that the new one is out. Make sure you uninstall the the old one, and then it'll find a new update and it'll go. So basically, it's with uh, it's uh, you know it's it's little fixes and yeah. uh, I'm not sure how many megs. Let me just say it's Why 134 at, meg file. Well, 134. John, you know, let me yeah. let me and remind, there's a little doc file. Let me remind people. You know, we talk about all these versions and you know server this and server that and preview this and preview that and you know the most of the folks that listen to this show know they you know they're going to whack TechNet here shortly and you're going to run out of you know, it's there's no inexpensive option anymore to test software. But let me just remind folks, they Microsoft did extend a little bit their options, especially on their server, for trial versions. So you can go out and easily download, like right now, Windows Server 2012 R2, Essentials, Data Center, Standard, all available in a, in a trial format. And I think they're 180-day trials at this point or something like that. That's a long time. <laughs> now, you know, again, you're not going to put this in production, but the true... Uh, the spirit of the law is that you're testing these things anyways. And so if you want to get a peek at them and try them out, they are available. They download in ISO super easy. You can. I've been messing around. Just just last night we were listening to Surface Geeks, and uh, one of the guys, I think it was other Jim, uh, who's in chat right now, said, hey, has anybody tried Data Center on that? And so I thought, oh, hey, I haven't tried that yet. So while, while the show was going on, downloaded Data, data Center, burned it to a DVD, threw it on the server, installed it, and uh, you and I, John and Mike Howard, last night were messing around trying to get that up and running. We're testing, you know, we're trying to create some some uh, storage pools and messing around with some of that other stuff. So pretty easy now to do it that way. You do need a key. This is where it's a little bit different. Microsoft has moved to a key methodology even for their trial. So they have a static key you'll need to download. You have to put that key in every single time, so it's a little bit, little bit slower. But uh, they, they do have those available. So don't feel like, because TechNet's going away, still you can't test anything, I can't try out the latest software, those kinds of things. If you're just testing it, many copies available out there for trial that you can use and to take advantage of. So don't don't fret, get out there. And I'll be honest, even though I have a MSDN and a TechNet, I've been using the trial versions. It's just, they're easy. You just download them, put one key in, I don't have to worry about burning an activation key. On, uh, on something that I'm just testing out, and it's worked great. So I'll give those trial versions a try. All right, what else? Yeah, and I encourage people to uh, to try those out because uh, one of the things is that Microsoft is like, now they're in the development stage, right? So it's like these bugs, when you see some, you know, an issue, you're saying, I found an issue with uh, backing up to... Uh, are using the USB stick to, to uh, create the, uh, the backups. Like, you know, you have to create a key so that when you, your PC dies, you'll put this USB key and you'll boot up your PC, it'll boot off the USB key, it'll find the server and then you restore the image. Well, in the R2 version, there was a problem creating this key. So I actually went to Microsoft site, I did a connect bug and they called me back. They, yeah, yeah, it's true, we reproduced this error and we'll fix it in the next build. So that's, what's, well, that's what I like is I encourage people to to try it out these test builds, you know, do it on not your production machine, you know, do it on the test box, get it going. If you find these bugs, you'll get it in because later on it's going to be too late or they're going to like move on to server 2015 or whatever. So, um, well, that's they, it. They expired yeah, the last thing that. I have was, uh, yeah, uh, like, like you said, you know, testing out uh, last night with the uh, storage spaces and the, and, uh, the roles and all of this. Um, when it, and, and I've said it in the past, like sometimes, you know, Again, they're coming up with the new software, and it's not all. Not, not everything is 100%. Not everything is working great, and, and there are bugs. And sometimes you'll try something out, and you say, you know, I must have did this wrong, and uh, you know, it's it's my fault. But it's like no, it's like sometimes there is a bit of a disconnect between what's going on, and uh, and that's a, a good example. Is here is where the, the uh, there's an article over at uh, Ars Technica. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. 
Jeez. Uh, Ars Technica, and they're talking about uh, preview your cloud on ramp in under under construction. It has to do with uh, storage. I think they talk a little about storage spaces and uh, another one. Let let me just open this up there. And they're talking about the work. Uh, would uh, one of the things Microsoft is trying to do is they called work folder, so you would have access. People basically, you have your laptop at home, but you're connected to your network at work. You know, even though you're you know physically in a different building, you can still get access to Microsoft is trying to make these VPN connections and these work folders stuff going on, and basically you're connecting to the server at work, and you're using the the files there. So, uh, but there's these they're having a couple of these little issues, and basically that's what this article is about. It's like you know these things are not completely. Uh, Baked. It's like on the server part is doing one thing, the essentials part is doing something else, and sometimes when you try to make both of them work together, you know, you start having these issues. So there's a good read for if you're uh, a Windows Home Server fanboy. Ren Renny just dropped. We're talking about an update to the. Uh, yeah. Oh, I just realized our latency is really bad, John. Um, I was wondering why I was walking all over you. Uh, we just we have some latency issues between you and me. Um, Rennie just popped in. He said the data center version six thousand one hundred and fifty-five dollars a CPU for Microsoft. So I don't think the average guy is going to be licensing data center in his house. Now I I had data center running last night, test mode free. So yeah, maybe you can't afford the real version, but if you if you do want to test it, you can do that as well. All right, good stuff, John. I want to give. Christian, uh, some time to chat a little bit. I got a question for him, and then I'll let him talk about anything else that he wants to talk about. But um, Christian, uh, this summer, we, we kind of asked you this question back in the spring, and it's just it's hard to believe that you're already done with your summer. I mean, it just, it just went so fast this year. Our interns were here and gone. You're here and gone uh, from, from your job. What tech was the most useful to you this summer? I mean, what did you really find... What, te what tech did you cling to and find very useful this summer? We asked you the question, what were you going to take with you? You were leaving your big box at home. You were taking a laptop and some other things. What what did you find you, you used the most? Um, interestingly enough, in the summer of work that I've done, I've really just relied on a good old-fashioned laptop and desktop for a lot of my work. Um a lot of what I've been doing is software development and using um, some other hardware that I don't own. So um, really, in terms of gadgets and outside need, there hasn't been that much. It's been a lot of internal uh, software development and using some tools like Eclipse and IDEs and uh, really, I mean, Microsoft Office for all the presentations and etc. So it, it sounds really boring, but <laughs> that's kind of all the essentials I needed to get a lot of the work that I needed done. So, now, Welcome to the world of the enterprise, right? Not, not necessarily sexy, just trying, to get, just trying to get it done, right? Your dad says, your note too, you got that in the beginning, right, of the, uh, before the summer? You had that? You took that phone? Oh, with you? that, very good point. That by far has been the biggest enhancement since that TouchPro 2 stuff. Um, really, I can go days without checking not that I should or want to, but um, I can get so much more done on this device. I don't always have to be opening up a laptop lid and all that because it's just so nice to work on um, and and really has been a, a treat, especially with the screen size and just popping emails and checking things up really quick. It's just really a nice tool. Did you um, you got your eyes on anything for the fall from a tech standpoint? Yeah, I know I want to go Lenovo. I want to. I know I want to go uh, uh, with a with a Haswell CPU. So I'm kind of holding out to the fall. Um, couple ones: the ThinkPad Helix Twist and the or sorry, the ThinkPad Helix and then the ThinkPad Twist are both two models that are super intriguing to me right now. Um, so it's kind of you know exciting. Um, to get out of, I guess, the standard old laptop big form and get get more mobile and you know tablet one day, laptop another, etc. So yeah, yeah, sounds good. Of course, those will, will run Windows 8. You'll probably upgrade those to Windows 8.1 uh, when that comes out in its full form. And to be given that a try. Any thoughts on uh, this? So this summer, I assume you worked mostly in Windows 7 then, in what you did. 
Yeah, believe it or not, I actually just installed Windows 8.1 on my old netbook, and I'm using that for, like, emails and reading, and that's going to be what I probably use to take notes in the classroom until I get a ThinkPad. So um, it actually runs 8.1 pretty decently, so I was, I was glad to see that, and I'm pretty comfortable with 8.1 now and like the interface and the netbook environment. I don't know if I'd like to have it on my... Mm, I don't know. I've, I've come... I've become much more comfortable with Windows 8 and especially with the 8.1 iteration and really there's not it's not like an earth shattering no there really thing. isn't it's, 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 it's not. not that different once it's you start not. you know now that the emotion is over with and and I use at work I use a Windows 7 laptop that's issued to me from work and then I bring with me a Windows 8 laptop that's touch and uh, that a great buy we've talked about it on this show a lot it's a little uh, Asus uh, Vivo book, and um, and I I don't I don't even I I don't even think about am I on Windows 7 or if I'm on Windows 8. I just use what I need to use. So you just kind of stop thinking about the the form or whatever it is, and you just use it. And I it, it for me I can seamlessly go in between and take advantage. And I'll I'll be honest, I use the desktop most often on Windows 8. I just, I do. That's just where stuff, the stuff that I need is just there. Metro has not yet become that useful for me. doesn't mean I need to be bitter about it or, you know, say it sucks. I mean, it's not, it's got, it needs some work, but it's just for me, I'm using the desktop a lot. And so I've gotten to the point, it sounds like maybe you have too, I've gotten to the point where that just stuff has just kind of disappeared now. And even when I'm on a Mac, had this conversation today. Even when I'm on a Mac, I, it takes me a few minutes to kind of switch around. Oh, that's right. This is over here, and that's over there. You just use the thing, right? I mean, it doesn't need to be a holy war, for God's sakes. I mean, at, at this point, they just they kind of work the same. I assume for you, you, you're not seeing a huge difference between seven and eight when you're flipping, you know, back and forth between enterprise and your personal stuff. Mm-hmm. Right. Very good. Anything, Christian? Anything else as we wrap up the summer? Any any epiphanies uh, from from your time? You know, there certainly every you know every opportunity you get kind of changes the way you know, you're going to look at school so much differently now than if you had not done these internships. But any epiphanies this summer? Anything we talked about big data a couple shows ago, and I know that's been on your radar um, from an enterprise perspective. We at Gallup talk about big data. We're in the data business, so we talk about big data all the time as well. But any other epiphanies uh, out there this summer as you kind of wrap up your your internship this week? Yeah. Um, I would have to say, if you were to ask me that question last summer, I would tell you big data is cool, but it's not revolutionary. Um, and this summer I'm convinced that it's revolutionary. And not just because it's hype and it's buzzwords, but I'm really not only seeing the enterprise adoption and even to kind of the, you know when the U.S. government is kind of putting all these capabilities in-house that um, there really is an innate need for um, big data capability. Um, and whether we're talking about Hadoop or NoSQL solutions or general systems, proprietary or public, it's a space everyone is racing to get involved with. And it's it's really it's a it's a stretcher for a lot of people because I think it took so many years for people to become comfortable with SQL databases and live in this transactional world where everything has a column and a table and you know it's really just not only is it more than that and it's more dynamic than that but again this idea of going from this programming rigid static era to this dynamic cognitive era is a change that by 2020 I, I can't even begin to imagine where these technologies are going to be like that um, and big data in particular is going to be advancing industries both inside the computing area and out you know global industries um, so it's going to have a global economic impact and I, so I think the biggest epiphany that I've taken away this summer is that the work I'm doing right now is working towards impacting that global economy because it is going to be the direct method and way in which businesses change their models, become more competitive, and work in their ecosystem using the data that the ecosystem is providing it that we've never collected or tried to tap into. And 
when you start realizing that we've sat on a lot of data we generated and never bothered to see what it's telling us, that tells us two things. It tells us, one, that we spent so much time learning to make data structures and create infrastructures that we were so caught up doing that, we never really took the time to do the analytics piece, which really was the ultimate goal of doing that in the first place. Um, and, and more importantly, I think a lot of people are starting to realize that they aren't going to be able to swim in the big pond if their company or their team isn't implementing and running those strategies. Also cost, I think it's becoming much more cost effective to do big data and data mining and I think industries are realizing that they're going to be able to save money and drive innovation by going to these technologies. So really I'm excited that my time at NASA um, put me in this world because I, I don't think there's there's really not too many I, I would say arguably artificial intelligence or cybersecurity might come close um, or be on par with the excitement that big data brings but it's one of the big three areas in computer science that has significant meaning and impact for the next ten years uh, and so I'm excited to be a part of it really because uh, we're going to be short uh, a huge amount of mathematicians. Uh, we're now hiring titles called data scientists. Who's going to be the next chief data scientist? I mean, uh, those that just that in of itself that HRs now consider who's their chief data scientist instead of who's their chief information officer is a huge shift in perspective from storing and maintaining information to analyzing, mining, and deriving insights from that information. So. It's going to be cool stuff, and mm. I, I really think that all these companies are waking up at the same time and realizing it. Um, a lot of the work that I'm going to be doing in my new position is helping to advance that technology and that capability um, in private sector to service the government work. So it's really clear that both public and private sector realize and need the capability and are actively seeking for professionals and capabilities that can be implemented into those types of structures. So, you know, as a general rule of thumb, um, hiring in the big data space is going to continue to rise because um, in order to facilitate the magnitude of work that's going to need to do to really build that autonomous um, cognitive thinking of computing, that's going to be the space, you know, We've gone from this programmable era to this big data era. The next kind of extension of big data is going to be cognition. Um, and it's going to be how close can machines become what is termed intelligent agents. People, there's some criticism of the word intelligent agents, but um, really you can think of it as how smart your computer becomes based on things that we already know, but we don't have time to know. Uh, so it's a very interesting thought when you think of all the things that we, you know, it's it's one of those expressions, you don't know what you don't know, and these machines are going to tell us what we don't know that we should know because we created that knowledge. So it's, it's, it sounds ridiculous to follow. Yeah, no, there's some, there's some good stuff ahead. I, you know, you, you made a comment, Christian, and I'll, I'll just kind of wrap things on this. We'll have some time in the post show if you want to hang around, we can talk about that, but you know, and John, uh, I'll sorry, this this will pertain to the United States, but I'm sure it's also applicable in Canada as well. So I'll just say this. Here in the United States, well, let me let me back up. The the listener demographics for my show are guys like me, not like Christian. We're not getting the Christians to listen to the show. We're getting guys like me, guys, you know, uh, let's just say 35 to 60, and uh, you've all got kids, and they're all going through school. They're in high school or junior high or some somewhere. That's the main demographic for the show. If your kids are in school, especially junior high, maybe in elementary school, we're not developing enough STEM, right? Science, technology, engineering, math. We are not developing enough of those kinds of students here in the United States. There's just not there's not enough to hire. We're having to import that talent in from other countries to make it work. And uh, we're not doing that because we're not getting the kids excited about the careers in those fields uh, here in the United States. Plenty of smart kids doing it. We're just not getting them excited early enough about the process. So let me encourage you, if you're a tech guy, and you probably are if you're listening to the show, get your kids excited about tech. Find some way to get them involved. Um, I'd love to be able to hire them someday. I'm kind of you know, saying this from a hiring perspective. 
love to be able to hire them, but uh, just from a from a general standpoint, make sure your kids, there's going to be gazillions of jobs out there in the United States around technology and make sure your kids are out there getting exposed. So just don't hide yourself in the basement. Uh, I, I made sure my kids all have computers and obviously Christian is the whiz. He is because his dad got him involved in technology very early and Christian always had access to that technology so he could learn and grow. And we just kind of need to do that as a country. I'm sure, John, that Canada needs to do that uh, as well. So I'll send that to our Canadian listeners and our Australian listeners and our UK listeners. Get your kids excited about uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. We need more folks doing that. So Christian, congrats on uh, the job. Congrats on uh, getting through the internship. I saw the letter on Facebook uh, that you posted out there. It's very, very impressive. You've Thank had you. a good run over the last couple years, and uh, it's exciting. The cool stuff for us, I think, is the best is yet to come for you. You know, we get to watch you go through college, uh, which is going to be just fun. I've always appreciated the fact that since you and I have been podcasting together for the last three years now, you've always allowed us in, you know, a peek in the door into your life on every single stage that you've gone through. And, uh, and that's been, that's, that's, that's a real privilege for us uh, and listeners. And I hope you, the listener, realize what a privilege it is to know Christian and to kind of walk him through. He's been very transparent. And uh, I keep, I get hits all the time back or get emails back uh, with people who've listened to the shows that you've done. On, you know, we did one on financing college. We did one on getting admitted to college. Uh, you know, get your kids uh, to to uh, to know Christian and what he does. Uh, he's doing some great stuff, and he's it didn't happen on accident. A lot of things went into this. And parents, you're as much responsible for having your kids do that as your kids are. So get out there, get motivated, get that done. And I, won't, I'm, I hope I'm not preaching to you. I just want to encourage you. Uh, it's kind of fun to kind of wrap up this summer. We're moving into fall. Christian will be. Uh, heading into school, and it's always a good time to sit back and reflect. So, Christian, congrats on all that stuff. Thank you. Oh, always great. All right. I, I said early in the show I've got a bunch of announcements, so John and Christian, you guys can take a nap for just a few minutes. I'm going to roll through these things real quick. If you made it to this part of the show, you're, you're, you're uh, you know, uh, the 1% of our most engaged listeners. And also, I'll say thank you for getting this far in the podcast. It's always good when you get to the end, and uh, we appreciate you, and we appreciate you listening. I did mention early in the show that we are, or that I will be sponsored by Drive Pop. Dave talked about that on his show. Oh, a couple weeks back, home server show, I want to say number, I can't remember. Uh, but Drive Pop is a cloud storage based solution, and there's some information out there. I'll include the links in it, but we want to thank Drive Pop. You can just go to drivepop.com if you want to take a peek at that. I think Dave's got some kind of deal going through his site as well. I didn't, I didn't spend a lot of time looking at it, but. I have a link as well on my site. They're going to sponsor my trip out to Indy and back. And so we want to say thanks to Drive Pop for doing that and uh, for all that they, uh, they're they going to do for the Home Server Show meetup. By the way, that's looking great. 60 folks or so registered. We have 90 slots that are open. I'd love for somebody to sponsor John Zadler so he could fly down and uh, and be a part of the, the show. So, you know, if you... If you, we really need about a thousand bucks. So if you if you're feeling philanthropic, philanthropic yeah. <laughs> and you want to uh, send Zadler down, we'll we'll take your money and bring Zadler into the country. It would be awesome to have him uh, come down and do that. So um, that is September 13th. And again, all that information out at thehomeservershow.com. Yesterday I ordered uh, a new three drive to two bay drive from icy dock and uh, i'll include that they call it the fat cage i love it that icy dock has such terrible <laughs> um uh model names that you can't remember so they started nicknaming their products this one's called the fat cage it fits three three and a half inch drives in a two drive bay and uh, that got ordered yesterday it's coming in it's going going in the big box uh, just on the other side of the monitors over here and i'm bringing that to the meetup and that'll be rated up and all set up with uh, Windows Server 2012 R2 Essentials ready for you to check out if you're coming to the meetup. So some new equipment coming that way as well. I mentioned if you need to ride to the meetup, I've got a link over at thehomeservershow.com for you to sign up for that. If you're coming from the airport, we want to pick you up and drop you off. So head over to homeservershow.com and get signed up. You know who you are, so just get over there and get that done. Um... Oh, a new post on the Roku 3. So my, my buddy at work, Amish, has been working on a Roku 3. He's had it now 50 days and uh, posted a while back his first impressions of it. And then today, just today, we posted 
kind of his impressions after 50 days on the Roku 3. So head out to the averageguy.tv. That's right at the top right now. This show, you know, we're recording this on August 8th. If you're listening to it a while from now, it might have disappeared. But I actually installed a new search uh, capabilities on the site. So just type in Roku 3. It'll take you right to it. And uh, you'll be able to review that. He had some interesting things to say about the Roku 3. Maybe took the shine off it a little bit. Not sure I'd buy it now. I'm waiting for the Chromecast. Speaking of that, I bought the Chromecast on Amazon a couple weeks back. I just missed the first round, so I missed all the all this everybody that got it that has it right now. And maybe that's a benefit, anyways. There's really no apps for it yet, so maybe by the time I get it, uh, there'll be some infrastructure around it. But the Chromecast has now been delayed to October 17th. So no Chromecast for a while. I'm sure we'll talk about that on the show here at some point, but. October 17th, initially they had said the end of April. I'm sorry, the end of August. Then it got moved to middle of September. Now we're talking middle of October before that will get to me. So if you ordered one, chances are you might want to take a peek and see it's a good chance it's been delayed if you got it off Amazon. Um, I, re- I will remind you one more time, we're sending this this uh, Kingston 32 gig data traveler to John Zadler. He was the, one of the first ones to respond to my call for the tech scholarship fund that we talked about last week. If you want to review something and it's in my budget, I've got money for it. We get that money through the uh, the Amazon associate link. So go to theaverageguy.tv slash Amazon. And if something you're interested in reviewing for me and putting on the site, we'll, we'll buy it, send it to you. You get to write about it a couple times, and then you get to keep it. So how's that sound? If you're interested in doing something like that and you have a passion for a project, just let me know. Sometimes they can't buy it right away. I'm out of money at the moment. I bought John something. Kyle Wilcox responded. Kyle's going to get an Android-based media center that he's going to take a peek at and write up for the site. So if you're passionate about it, like I am about a Drobo, although I probably couldn't buy you a Drobo, uh, we'll get that uh, purchased and sent out to you, and you can uh, you can do some writing on it as well. Okay, one last thing. Uh, I, the other day I purchased the Sport. Fi S6 earbuds, earbuds, or ear, no, earbuds, earbuds are a different product. Kevin Schoonover had, had used them in the podcast, and he said, yeah, these are great, so I gave him a try. Uh, they're all right. They don't work great for podcasting, but I'll give these away to anybody. I didn't even use them. I tried them one time, threw everything back in the box, and said, mm, not as good as earbuds. Uh, now, the difference is these are half the price, so They work really well if you're just listening to music. It didn't work well for podcasting because I need to hear ambient sound when I'm podcasting. But uh, if you're on a plane, these would be great. They block out all the sound that's going on around you. If you want to win these, here's what you got to do. And this is for just our most engaged listeners to do that. And I will just ship them off to you and you can have them. What you need to do is tell a friend about the show. right? Just tell a friend. Go tell somebody to come and listen to the show. Have them listen to one podcast. That's it. And it can even be a financial tech podcast. 15 minutes. That's it. Come out and listen to it, and then have your friend send me an email, podcast at theaverageguy.tv, and, and have them tell me what they listen to. All right? First person to do that, but make sure your friend includes your name in it so I know how to get back. First person that does that gets the, earbud, gets the earbuds. How's that sound? They're retail price about 25 bucks. So, you know, don't kill yourself for them. But we'll send those. It's kind of cool. They come with the, here's, they actually come in a case like this, a little hard, hard case. And um, it's got a ear. It's got a you know one of these things you can put on your arm for it. And then the other cool thing about it, it's the it's got that memory the memory wire that goes around your ears here. Here, there we go. The little memory wire up there go around your ear. And then it's also got a long and a short cord. So if you're gonna put it if you're gonna put it on your arm. It's got a short cord. This comes apart, and it's also got an extension if you're going to put it all the way down to your waist. So this would almost be a fitness tech giveaway. But uh, here on Home Tech, we do that as well. So tell your friend. Have them listen to a podcast. Have them email podcast at theaverageguy.tv. First person to do that, I will ship these out to you for that as well. All right. Man, it's a lot of stuff. Did I miss anything, guys? Okay. You're good. I will take that silence as uh, as no, I didn't miss anything. Lots of stuff. We appreciate you, the listener, coming out and uh, and joining us each and every week. Why wow, the numbers have been great, the Amazon numbers have been good, and we appreciate you listening each and every week and getting involved in the podcast. Lots of different ways. We have all the links if you want to automatically download the podcast and listen to it each week. Amazon, 
me see if I can just name a few. So we have Amazon, we have Stitcher, we have Audioboo, we have Podomatic. We've got it's just a straight RSS feed. You can do it through Zoom. There's no excuse not to be listening to the podcast automatically every single week. I use uh, Beyond Pod on the Android. Lots of other apps that can do it and help you manage that. And uh, so get that subscribed, and uh, that way you don't you miss it every week. I do appreciate the comments that you send back at podcast at theaverageguy.tv, and I'm getting more of those. It's just really fun to communicate with you guys. So I appreciate that as well. If you subscribe to the YouTube channel, it gets you nothing, but do it anyways because it's good for us. They actually, um, Google lowered the number of subscriptions required for YouTube Live. Actually, Mike Howard is taking advantage of that right now. You can use Wirecast or XSplit to automatically. Now, we're using Hangouts on Air to do this, so we have Christian and, and uh, John coming in, Hangouts. And we would have had Andrew, but he never made it tonight. Sorry, Andrew. He just We waited for him, and he just didn't make it in. But uh, we just use on air. Uh, you can also, there's a thing called YouTube Live that you can use. They lowered that subscription. We've been talking a long time about getting that down to 100. I mean, 1,000, getting it up to 1,000. We don't need it anymore. But still, subscribe. TheAverageGuy.tv slash YouTube. We also join our Facebook group, TheAverageGuy.tv slash Facebook. Great conversation. Love you guys that uh, out there getting engaged in the conversation. Some really good stuff. Of course, you can join the Google group, TheAverageGuy.tv slash Google. Do you see the pattern here? Pretty much anything. If you want to buy Microsoft products, TheAverageGuy.tv slash Microsoft. Right. One sad note, geeks.com did close down. They shut their doors. We had an affiliate link out there. If you went to TheAverageGuy.tv slash geeks, uh, that was geeks.com. They just closed their doors this week, so another retailer bites the dust. Thank you, Amazon, for doing that, putting them out of business probably. And, uh, and so we've, uh, we no longer have an affiliate relationship with them, but we do like with Best Buy and some other ones like that. Chances are if you type in theaverageguy.tv slash something, it will show up to something. So we'll be back next Thursday, I hope. I don't have anything planned. We need to come up with a topic if you're listening to this in real time and, you, and uh, maybe you'd have a topic you want us to cover. Christian will probably be en route, and so he might. Uh, why don't we give you the week off next week, Christian? You've got, you've got a, a lot of things going on, so we'll give you the week off. But if there's something you'd like to talk about or something you'd like to have us talk about, some kind of subject, send me an email, email podcast at theaverageguy.tv, and uh, we'll see if we can get it covered. John, thanks for coming out. Always good to have you on. We had you on two weeks in a row. That's a new record. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought I was going to talk home server last week, and then we got into the hard drives, and I said, ah, I, I missed my fix. But you made up for it this week, so thanks yeah, for no, having me. You bet. Good to have you on. Christian, great to have you on. Enjoy your week off uh, next week as you travel back home, and uh, use that to get all settled in before you uh, head out for the new digs and whatever you got to do. Thanks for coming out. Absolutely. Pleasure to be here. As yeah, always. It's, it's, it's always good. You know, I can just see it's been a long summer for you. <laughs> I appreciate you coming out tonight. Great to have Absolutely. you. Yep. Yeah, good stuff. We'll stay around for the post show. If you want to do that again, you can only catch the post show if you catch us live. And to catch us live, you need to come out to the average guy.tv slash live Thursday nights, 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern. 11 a.m. Eastern Australia time, 1 UTC, all those times. Just get out here and join us live. Love to have you out here. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>